Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Something gets unlocked in your life when you fast. Fasting prepares you to receive God's answer. It really does. Uh, not only that, but fasting also prepares your heart to say, not my will, but your will be done, Father. Let me give you uh, just nine reasons why you should fast. Uh, because like I said, this is our last week and, uh, and you, you can still make a change. Uh, number one, why should I fast? Well, if you're in need of healing or a miracle, you should fast. Number two, do you need a tender touch of God in your life? Number three, is there a dream inside of you that only he can make possible? Number four, are you in need of a fresh encounter with God? Number five, do you desire a deeper, more intimate, and powerful relationship with the Lord? Number six, are you wanting to be more sensitive to the desires of God for your life? Number seven, is there a friend or a loved one that needs salvation? Number eight, do you desire to know God's will for your life? Come on, if you really want to know God's will for your life, you got to pay a price for that. You have to be willing to sacrifice uh, just a little bit. And, uh, and I know that when we're talking about fasting or abstaining ourselves from food, it, that's not easy, but it takes a sacrifice. And God sees from heaven the sacrifices you make for him uh, when you really want to know his will. Uh, number uh, nine, do you need to break away from bondages that have been holding you hostage, addictions, and habits? Everybody say habits. And that's what I want to talk to you about today because here's the reality. For the last few weeks, we've been talking about change. And if you want any, any type of long-lasting change, you have to realize that you're going to have to break some habits. Um, habits are powerful. We all have them. Nobody gets away from habits. Uh, we all have good habits and we also have bad habits. The question is, which one do you live with intention? And uh, hopefully the ones you do live with intention are habits that are bringing you blessings and breakthroughs and not bondage. And so I want to talk about this subject today. And I want you to listen because I'm going to do a little twisty on you. And uh, hopefully you'll, you'll hear this message in, in a different way. You'll, you'll perceive it differently. You'll understand it differently. Maybe today you'll walk away and have a, a, a greater revelation of, of habits uh, because I can't bring a practical message on habits, but I'm going to bring you a spiritual uh, perspective of habits and what God thinks about those. And uh, once again, um, you change your habit, you change your life. Let me give you uh, the first point. If you're a note taker, I want you to know this. If you have our church app, I always give our notes out, so uh, download it if you don't have that. Character is formed by habits. I'm going to say that again. Character is formed by habits. Say that with me. Character is formed by habits. And when you think about that, what, is it, what does this mean? That means that we are what we repeatedly do. We are what we repeatedly do. You see, before um, coming to Christ, even maybe the first months of coming to Jesus, um, I can tell you that I had a habit of uh, intimidation of any people that were intelligent. I had a habit of of feeling uh, uh, inferiority of, of just any success. I was afraid to fail. Um, I had uh, uh, all kinds of habits that were holding me bondage. Not just that, but I had, see, there's this term called generational curses that we, that we all uh, adopt in our life regardless, uh, that our family left us. But beyond that, I believe that there were generational habits that were passed down um, to, to, to me and my, my, my brothers and my sisters that, um, that we really didn't want. But for some reason, when you've been formed for so long, it just becomes you. For example, my mom, you know what? One of the good habits my mom left me was my work ethic. Uh, I'm a very hard worker, and I'm not just saying that I love to work. I love working. I've always loved work. And, uh, and I remember being a little kid and uh, my mom being a single mom, feeding four mouths, and... Um, and she worked for the Beverly Hills Hotel for like a bazillion years. And on the side, she cleaned houses. And uh, sometimes I would just tell my mom I wasn't feeling well. And uh, just so I can go to work with her and hang out. 
And so I would skip school and go to work with her. And, and I would watch how, how much she was appreciated. I would watch how people would, would respond to her and how, how she worked with such excellence and how much favor she had and, and, and promotion after promotion. And then I would go with her and we'd clean houses. And, and my mom would always tell me, and this is how you vacuum. And I got so good at vacuuming. You know those, those diamond lines that you leave, right? Just like, like they were just like on point. My, my mom was like, ah, you're awesome. She would give me uh, uh, Pepsi and, and uh, chili cheese Cheetos if I did it really well. <laughs> like that was my payment. You know what I'm saying? I didn't care, man. I wanted chili cheese Cheetos. And, uh, and, and so I became so good and so excellent at, at helping her clean that it really began to form a habit of, of, of very good work ethic, of work hard and, and be responsible and, uh, and, 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 you know, finish what you start, etc. And so those are good habits. And parents, let me tell you something. Right now, whether you like it or not, you are already leaving a legacy of habits in your children right now as we speak. And hopefully they're positive ones, they're good ones. Uh, and once again, uh, today I'm preaching to the choir, guys. This message is for me. I'm right now in my 21 day of change as well. You're not the only one. There's some habits that I have to break off of my life and, uh, and some things that, that I need to have removed from my life just as much as you do as well. So this message is for everyone here. Nobody gets away from it. Um, so let's talk about this. Have you ever looked at a picture um, and you're looking at it and it's like a 10-year-old picture and you're just like, dang, I look fly, right? You're just, <laughs> for some of you that don't know what that means, AKA awesome, you look sharp, you look like, wow, right? You're just like, and then you look at yourself in the mirror, you're like, dang, what happened, right? <laughs> and it's like, you know, you're just like, you're, you know what I'm saying? You start, you start looking and, and, uh, and, and you're just like, man, what, what happened to me? I'll tell you what happened, habits. You know, maybe you're, you're a little bit overweight. Uh, maybe you aged a little bit too fast. Uh, uh, maybe uh, you look more depressed than you did then. Maybe there was more joy in that time. Uh, uh, it all goes back to uh, your habits. Why? Because I am what I repeatedly do. And so think about this. If you're repeatedly being a negative person, right, what kind of person are you? You're negative. Uh, if, if you're always seeing the worst in every situation, uh, that goes back to the habit that you can never find anything good in a situation or even a person. And then without even knowing You've, or even thinking, you've created these habits that have become you, not in a good way, but because you lack the, 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 the reality or the, 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 the idea of being able to see your reality because you've learned to coexist with your habit, your bad has become your good. And so I'm, I'm here to, to bring some freedom to us today. Hopefully, we'll, we'll get some revelation today and, and, and uh, we can be fly with God uh, and, and be amazing because we, we all have habits. For example, you know what? Um, there are some people in this room that you have the, uh, the nail-biting habit. You know, always biting your nail. Let me see all my, my nail-biters. Just put your nails in the air. <laughs> yeah. Then, then you, got, you got the people that are overspenders. You just... You buy everything you see, like, oh, my God, this would look great. And you know what? You just, like, before you know it, your garage is filled with stuff, and you're just like, where in the heck? How, how, why, do I, why did I even buy this? And so you got the overspenders. You also have people that have the habit that they're good starters, but they're not good finishers. You know, they're always starting something new. They're visionaries. Yeah, you're a visionary, but you can't complete a task. You can't execute. And, uh, and you know what, your, your passion changes every year. Every year it's a new thing, and, and, uh, and that can be a, a, a not so good of a habit if you start something but you can't finish something. Uh, there's also the habit of being late, uh, like coming to church late, you know. Uh, the habit of being a procrastinator. You wait to the last minute, and then you expect excellence. You know, you expect creativity, but you're always waiting to do everything at the last minute, and, and you're expecting these amazing, incredible results, but you're not willing to sacrifice or put in the time and the effort and the energy needed in order for it to be, like, phenomenally blessed the way you want to see it. There's also people that, man, they just have the habit of, of sleeping into the crack of noon. 
You know, it's just like they just sleep and they sleep and and they or it's it's sleep, watch TV, go to movies, hang out, sleep, and go to work. Maybe there's work in there for some people. You know, uh, but there's these habits that 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 have been created or instilled in um, in us, and without even knowing it, you continually repeat that same habit, and and you didn't even think how it formed you. And there's different people in this room right now that have a, a habit that may not be bringing you the, the results or even the blessings that you want to see in your family, in your walk with God, uh, in your business, maybe in your career, whatever that might be. But, uh, but praise God that habits can be changed. Man, I'm so glad that we can change. That's why we highlight the C-A-N, that you can change. It's not a matter that, that you can't change. It's a matter that most people have an issue with, I won't change, because you feel that you've arrived, and that's, that's not going to work for you very well. Here's another point. Habits are formed by discipline or lack of discipline. Habits are formed by discipline or lack of discipline. So in other words, you know what? You might as well put some intentionality to, uh, to, to growing and to changing because either way, you are disciplining yourself to create bad habits. So you might as well put the energy in and create some really good habits in your life. And if you want to have some good habits, then you have to realize that, man, I have to get this flesh back in control because this flesh is never going to lead you any closer to God. I bet for some of you, it was a challenge just to get to church because you're like, should we go today? Should we not go today? Are we feeling it today? Are we not? This flesh is never going to tell you, let's read our Bible. This flesh is never going to tell you, hey, we should pray about that situation. This flesh is never going to tell you, hey, you should forgive that person even though I know they were wrong and they were off and they hurt me. See, this flesh, if, if you don't submit it to your creator, this flesh will lead you to a lot of bad places in life. And this flesh will also help you create all kinds of habits that don't bring or even promote the life of God in us. That's why we fast and we pray because we say to this flesh, you know what? I'm going to dethrone you, king stomach, and I'm going to put the king back in, in the chair where he belongs, right? In the, the chair of my heart, and I'll let him guide me and lead me. And that's why we fast and we pray. But let's talk a little bit more about this. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, I want to show you this in the Amplified Version. It says, so here's what I want you to do. Now, this is obviously, you know, the word of God. He's, he's, he puts some, some, some requirements in our change. He, he puts a standard for our change. He puts an expectation in our change. And he says, here's what I want you to do. God helping you. He says, take your everyday ordinary life. You're sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as a what? As an offering. Well, let me tell you something. As you're fasting and praying, hopefully, you already did it or you're still in it with us, you are literally, you are placing your life in the presence of God, and you are now becoming a offering to God. Why? Because you're saying, God, I know I want that Twinkie. I know I want to keep doing life my way, but God, for these next 21 days, I'm going to place my life in your hands as an offering, and that's what you do. When you fast and pray, you're giving your life as an offering to him, okay, and he goes on to say, embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture, or don't become so well adjusted to your habits, okay, that you fit into it without even thinking. And you know what? I've preached this message before. Man, you should think for a change, huh? And that's what happens, that we have so many people that, that have, have knowledge of God, but there's no transformation. It's just information. And God wants to take you from information to transformation so that you can see the change that you desire. And listen, he desire, desires it more than you. And he says... Uh, instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it, unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you. 
develops well-formed maturity in you. So check this out. These are the two things that God says. Number one, he says, I will bring the best out of you. I don't know about you, but man, there have been people in my life that have not always brought out the best in me. There may be people in your life right now that are not bringing out the best in you. There may be some friendships that, that you've cultivated for so long that have not brought out the best of you. As a matter of fact, you're always angry when you're around them. But for whatever reason, you've created this habit of, I have to have this person in my life. If I don't have you in my life, oh my God, I don't know what my life would be like. It'd probably be better. It would probably be awesome. You'd probably be less stress. You'd probably have more joy. You'd probably be more happy if you got rid of that person. Listen, not everyone in your life right now, okay, qualifies to be in it. Not everyone. And until you accept that truth, you're just going to keep allowing yourself to do things without even thinking about the kind of people that God wants to place in your life. I have noticed that, that the people that I, that I never thought I would have a good connection with are the people that I have the best connection with. Because as, as, as human nature, we always want to be around with the popular folk, right? You want to be around with the people that got it all together. You want to be around people that are your kind. You know, come on, let's, let's not be fake in church. You know what your kind looks like. It's got to be my color. Yeah, it's got to be my, my, my social status. Yeah, it's got to be my financial status. And, and I've realized that, that when you start doing things like that, you're cheating yourself from the most divine relationships that God wants to bring into your life to make you a better, better person. I'm telling you, I trip out. Like, the best people in my life are the people that I least expected to ever have a connection with. Least expected. And so that's, that's those are habits that we've created where, where we get so stuck in, 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 in the type of, of people we think need to be in our life. But I promise you when, you, when you, when you give your life to God, God will begin to bring some clarity and say, hey, you know what? That person's right for you. That person's not. That person's for you. That person's against you. And, and is, is God a hater? No, he's not a hater. But, but the truth is this, is that not everyone, once again, qualifies to be in your life. You know, God loves them. He don't hate. He loves. But, but what's coming out of you? And number two, he says, he will develop well-formed maturity in you. So if there's well-formed, there must be disformed as well, right? And so I think that in today's church culture, there's so much disformed Christians. Instead of being well-formed, when you give your life to God, he forms you well. He forms the right habits. He forms the right attitude. He forms the right spirit inside of you. But when you constantly keep doing things in your own effort, your own strength, your own wisdom, your own counsel, you begin to see that, man, I'm so misinformed and I'm so disformed. And God's saying, but if you give your life to me, I'll begin to well form you. And he begins to create the right habits inside of you. Listen, we need God. You can't do this without God. Keep doing that every year. Tell me how that's working for you. Come on, if you have this lack of peace, lack of joy, lack of happiness, man, if you're lacking faith, if you're constantly doubting, I can tell you why. It, 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 it points back to the habits that you and I have created within us. And then we wonder, why am I not further along? You're looking at your life today. I'm telling you, it all goes back to habits. Say it with me, habits. habits. So we all need repeated change as a follower of Jesus Christ. You need it. I need repeated change. I need repeated change. That means that every single year, there's got to be a new me. There's got to be a new you. There's got to be a, a, a better version of you this year than there was last year. And that has to be with intention. You know what? Every single year, I set goals in my life, and I say, okay, Mauricio, um, this year, I look at my 2017, and then I begin to think about my 2018, and I see the things I lacked in 2017. I say, okay, these are the ones I'm going to make better. And I also look at the strengths of 2017, and I say these, I'm going to even make them super much better. And so you have to make sure that you're growing with intention. And uh, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you better know that change comes with it. Now, why do people have a challenge when it comes to change? I'm going to give you some simple reasons. Number one is they've learned to live with that habit. 
So when you learn to live with, a, with, with, with maybe a habit that's not bringing you life, um, you coexist with it. And so when you've gotten used to something for so long, it's hard to get rid of something that's been comfortable for so long. So you just kind of stay with it because, you know, what? It, it's what I know. It's what I do. The second thing is change is uncomfortable. Change is very uncomfortable. Fasting is uncomfortable, guys. It's not easy. I mean, if you're sitting here today and you're saying, man, fasting is so easy, man, you're lying. You're, 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 you're sneaking a Twinkie in there here and there. You're doing something. <laughs> There's no way in heck. Fasting is not easy. It's the most challenging thing to do. Why? Because you're, you're restraining yourself from, from food. Well, that's uncomfortable. You know, when your stomach is growling, you know, you saw Julie's testimony. She's like, man, by the second week, I was like doubting. Okay, that's real. That's raw. But change is uncomfortable. Change hurts. Change doesn't feel good all the time. Okay, number three, change will cost you your willingness and your cooperation. Change will cost you your willingness. So many people want to change until they need to change. It's so true. Everybody says, yeah, I want to change, but won't pay the price that comes with change. And that, that's a sacrifice. It takes a sacrifice. Look at this. John 15, 1 and 2 says this. He said, now this is in the red. He says, I am the true vine. Okay, so now, now Jesus is talking about some, like some real raw change. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit. So look, God has an expectation for you and me. God doesn't just save you, deliver you, and then allow you to live the life that you want to live. No, God has an expectation. When you come to Jesus Christ, he puts an expectation of wanting to see fruit in your life. And I'm sure many of you, hopefully you want to see fruit in your life. You want to have fruit in your marriage, fruit in raising your children, fruit in your finances. Hopefully you want to see fruit in your relationships, okay? Fruit, not nuts, okay? We've got too many nuts in the church. We need more fruit, right? We need fruit. And so he says, um, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that continues to bear fruit, he what? Repeatedly. He what? Repeatedly. He what? Repeatedly. I'm telling you, listen, God is all about repeatedly doing what he needs to do in you. Why? Because I am what I repeatedly do. Well, God says, well, guess what? There's going to be some things that I'm going to repeatedly do in your life that's going to make you better. Now, watch this. He says, he repeatedly prunes so that it will bear what? More fruit, even richer and finer fruit. Now, some of you may be here today saying, well, you know what? Man, I'm doing pretty good, man. I love Jesus. I, I, I give to Jesus. I give to great causes. Well, that's awesome, but, but guess what? But even when you're in a good place with God, God still says, and I still want to prune you. I still want to deal with you. I still want to address some issues with you. In other words, you're pruned if you do, and you're pruned if you don't. You're pruned. So you might as well be intentional and be like, God, all right, I'm going to stop resisting. Now prune. Because I know that so many of us, we, we just have this prayer life of give me, give me, give me. And, and listen, and there's nothing wrong with asking God to give you something. But there is something wrong when it's all about you and, and all you ever pray to God is for him to give you Whatever it is your need, but you're never, you're never praying, God, you know what, uh, prune me. Uh, you know, here's how it works. So, you know what, you have, you're the tree, right? He says, I'm the vine, you're the what? Branches, right? And, and he says, and, and what I do is I come in, <laughs> and see, this, is, this, is like, this isn't easy, because he comes in, and then he begins to, to ah, cut that attitude. Huh? Got a little attitude, Mauricio. And then he comes and he's like, okay, you know, we're going we're gonna to cut that mindset of, of what you think about that person because you think that, that I'm in agreement with you. And God's like, I'm not in agreement with you. I'm in agreement with my word. Let's cut that off. Right? And it's like, ouch. You know, and then he finds another person. Okay, you know what? Man, I love your worship. But, man, let me tell you something. But you're always late. Let's deal with that. 
and God starts pruning. And then you know what? <laughs> we, we become like that tree that all of a sudden, man, we're just pointing up because we're like, yay, I let God prune me. And now you're like, okay, God, reward me now. Give me fruit. Right? And then you know what God does? He says, okay. <laughs> I'll give you fruit, all right. And then he starts going for the big stuff, right? And you're like, whoa. See, you're willing to adjust your attitude, but you're not willing to adjust your lifestyle. And God says, with me, we adjust everything. Because when God brings change, he brings change with a purpose so that you may bear fruit. He brings change for a purpose that you may bear fruit in your family. He brings change and prunes in your life so that you may bear fruit in your relationships. You know what? If you're a business person, he even brings pruning to your business. Why? Because God wants you to bear fruit in your business. He, he will prune you in your work, in your work of uh, your, your place of work so that you can be the employee that represents God with excellence, right? That you represent God with, with integrity, that you represent God with, with godly character because anyone can have character, but not everybody has godly character, right? And character will keep you where the anointing wants to take you, but you got to allow God to do some pruning in your life. And it, it doesn't feel good all the time because you know what? I believe that sometimes, you know what? When you finally allow God to start pruning you and you're dealing with stuff and you're like, okay, God, I give up. And then now you feel like you're this tree that's pointing up to, to heaven. We're like, oh, finally, I'm so pruned. But you know, let me tell you something. Every great tree still has a jacked up branch, <laughs> right? You may look all like, yes, Lord. But it's like, there's, it's like this one, right? This is what it looks like, right? You're like, yay, Lord, thank you. And God's like, no, this looks ugly, man. We're gonna, <laughs> You know, <laughs> you know what? Because we always see the best in ourselves, right? Nobody ever wants to come clean. Nobody ever wants to take responsibility. Nobody wants to say, I'm rude. Nobody wants to say, you know what? I'm not really faithful. No one wants to say, I'm not really loyal to God. If it was between God and my friends, I'd choose my friends. And God says, you know what? That's not the way I work. He says, because whom I love, I prune. And I prune because I want you to bear awesome fruit. I want, you to, I want you to produce awesome relationships. I want you to produce awesome friendships. I want you to produce awesome family. I want you to produce awesome children. But that requires pruning. Let me tell you something. Parents, be the model of allowing your children to see God prune you. And then be real with them. Tell them, you know what? Daddy's being pruned right now. What'd you do, Daddy? <laughs> well, <laughs> can't talk about that. And then listen, also, people, stop being the pruner. Huh? Always trying to prune people. Let me, let me go ahead and fix you, man. You know? <laughs> Wives, stop it. <laughs> I said wives, yes. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I have a wife up here. She's like, is that what you said? Yeah, I said it, girl. I said it. Yeah, now what? There's a Holy Spirit. God doesn't need your help. Oh, no, but if I just, I'll, I'll bring conviction to him. You're killing him. Ladies, can I get an amen? Uh, yeah, you don't want to admit it, yeah. Uh, oh, no. Oh, no. It's for his good. I love him. Yeah. No, listen. I have learned to. Listen, I have two kids. I have a 23-year-old, and my son's about to be 19, and I'm just like, wow, God. But I thank God that both my kids, they love God. But you know what? As a dad, I want the best for my kids. Like, I'm always like, <laughs> fruit. <laughs> but, but I've learned that I have to allow my children to discover and find their own conviction so that God can have a personal, intimate relationship with them and not with daddy. Because then your kids, now 
their relationship is based on mommy and daddy instead of the relationship being based on them and their savior. And so you got to put the scissors down. Because you ain't helping no one. And it's hard to put it down when you see the potential in someone and they ain't changing. God never called you to change anyone. You can barely change yourself. Try losing 10 pounds. Help us, Jesus. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Let, let's, let's, whom he loves, he prunes. You can't claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ and you don't allow God to address you in places in your life. There's no such thing. There's no such thing of you doing. Listen, you can't be the Christian that says, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. However, however, I will follow Jesus, but not so close where I have to get dirty with him. Not so close. Like, I'll follow Jesus, but not so close where I have to sacrifice for him. Well, what do you mean I have to serve? Whoa, 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 whoa. What? I don't wash feet. That's nasty. But, but there's, a, there's, a, there's a new definition of Christianity today in America where we've come up with our own religion. But it makes sense because when you read your Bible, read your Bible. It says in the last days, and men will give heed to doctrines of demons. In other words, you start creating your own theology. Listen, stop creating your own theology. Stick to God's word. It's already laid out for you. Stop making excuses of why you're not changing. God already addresses every single area of our life. That includes family. That includes children. That includes your personal life. That includes relationships. That includes everything. Everything that you need is founded in the word of God. God already has an answer for that. Stop resisting. Well, that's not the kind of, you know, it's not the kind of Christian I am. That's the problem. You're not. God says, give me your life as an offering. Can I leave you with one more thought? And then let's get out of here. And I want to leave you this thought because I believe it's so important for you to understand that uh, pruning is simply to cut away or to trim off. That's all he does. He cuts away or he trims off. Okay. He doesn't cut you. He doesn't go... Bon Kui Kui style. You guys remember Bon Kui Kui? Yeah, he doesn't do that. I mean, he'll cut you, but not like that. Yeah, he'll, he'll, he'll trim. He'll trim. He'll trim. <laughs> um, let me leave you with this thought. Matthew 7, 7, 16 says this. It says, you will know them by their fruit. Okay, so when I look at a man or a woman, I, I don't just get hooked up or linked up with anyone. I, I don't do it. I've had so many people that have come to me and say, hey, can we do this together, this business together? Can we do it? I'm like, nah, why? Because God has a measuring stick and it's called fruit. And so you have to look at the, the fruit or the character of a person before you start getting involved with that individual. Like dating, for instance. Oh, he's so cute. And you measure cute or you may measure relationship with cute but cute looks ugly too you know it, it it can jack you up cute can jack you up for many years and so it's not what's cute it's is there fruit is there fruit in her life is there fruit in his life is there is there real change in in that person do they love god uh, or are they an antichrist? You don't have to be an atheist to be an antichrist. You can be someone that has an issue with God's word, and you are an antichrist. Okay, so it's not just being an atheist. No, it's whenever you're anti-anything God says, you are an antichrist. Because God is never going to flex his word for you. He is never going to bend backwards or bend forwards for anyone. We are the ones that bow. We take the knee. Not God. Amen? I know it's an uncomfortable message, but it's all good. You're going to make it. Now, let me just be honest with you. Here's what happened. And be careful that it doesn't happen to you. A few more minutes, I'm done. The children of Israel were men and women that were on the right path with God. They, they honored his, his ordinances. They, they, they loved God. But 
what happened was along their way, as, as they were following God, as they were following his ways, they got very comfortable. And, and just like us, generational things started happening. You know what? This generation that originally started with God, they had the skill and the ability to do things that God taught them. But just like us, we, we, we've been with God. Maybe for some of you, have been with God for a while. And God taught you some ways and God taught you some things and, and God taught you conviction and God taught you right from wrong and you're walking in that way. But along the way, a next generation comes in and little by little, the culture of this world begins to form and to, and to change what you once believed was a conviction in your life, something that you would never do then, you now are doing today. Why? Because this world also has a way of creating habits in us and then what happens happened with the children of Israel, they went from being skilled to having, having habits of being lazy and not taking care of not only their, their, their spiritual walk, but even just the physical things that they needed to do to provide for their families. So, so at one point, the Israelites used to sharpen all their tools. They had the ability. They, they had the knowledge of, of how to do that. But along the way, as, as they kept living their life, don't freak out. I got a little thing right there. Don't trip. Um, they, 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 would, they would lose the edge. And, and you know what they would do? They would uh, go down to the Philistines, and we'll talk about that right now. And they would have someone else sharpen all of their tools because they lost they lost the ability. They lost the, 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 the skill set to do what was entrusted to them. And so look at this quickly, quickly. Let's get out of here. I want you to go quickly to uh, Ecclesiastes 10.10. And here's what happens with us. If you're not careful as a, as a Christian, you can become so, so dormant to the things that God has already placed in you you can become so, so spiritually dry. You, you can become a, a, a sleepy Christian. Uh, why? Because this world will just, it'll lullaby you to sleep. It'll just put you to sleep. That's what this world does. Parents, please, your children, man, if you're going to sleep, your kids are going to sleep. And the enemy wants to put people to sleep. And so look what Ecclesiastes 10.10 10 says. He says, if the axe is what? Dull. If the axe is what? Come on, if your spiritual walk is dull, he says, and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. Listen, when you do things your way, you're constantly just like, ah. Oh. And then you know what happens as a Christian? You get exhausted, you get tired, and you start saying things like this, ah, oh, church ain't for me. Oh, that church, they're just, they're just judging me. No, the church isn't judging you. You just know that you're falling under this category called conviction, and you don't like what you're hearing. But, you, but God knows that you were going to be here today, and now you have no excuse because guess what? You heard the message already. <laughs> Brought to you by God Almighty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now there's no excuse. Now, why? God's going to be like, no, I told you. You sat in that service. Now you're accountable to that word. I ain't coming back. That's all right. You're accountable to that word anyways. So you can keep doing this. Do it with your own strength. You can keep doing it with your own effort. You can keep doing it with your own earthly wisdom. But guess what? He says, your acts will get dull. But he says, but wisdom brings what? Success. You know what wisdom is? Give your life to God. That's wisdom. And so here you have the children of Israel who had this bad habit of like, ah, uh, well, just let someone else handle it. Hey, guys, uh, I bet it was like someone like me that would come like, hey, guys, you guys are there. It's like, hey, guys, are you guys ready to sharpen our, our hoes and our axes and, and all this stuff so we can, you know, do our thing? And you're like, well, just go ask the Philistines to do it. Okay. Come back. And it just becomes repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. You start doing the same thing over and over again, right, repeatedly. It got so repeated that they lost their way. Of doing it now it's like hey how do we do this dude i don't know go go see the philistines I, we've never done that before that's what happens to us and so here we have now in first samuel 13 20 says so all of the people of israel had to go down to the philistines they had to go to them to get their plows their hoes their axes and their sickles sharpened 
Listen, this scripture was a sad day to read. It was a sad moment in history when the children of Israel in the camp of God, when the people of God in Elevate Church or whatever church you attend if you're visiting us, man, you forgot how to live for God. All the children of Israel, all of them, they had to pay other people to do what was their responsibility. Listen, the school system is not the responsibility to change your child. You are mom. You are dad. Huh? Be responsible. Ah, oh, the school will teach them that stuff on sex. No. You teach them. Because the world will teach them a whole other revelation of that. You teach them on everything. Why? Because if the edge is dull, sharpen it. Because when you sharpen them with God, you're going to bring them success. Oh, they'll, get, they'll figure it out, praise God. No! You're responsible. Your children are on loan to you. They're not even yours. Oh, no, I birthed them. Yeah, but he gave them. Oh, yeah, you birthed them, all right, but he gave them. Be responsible. And so here, they, they, the danger in all this, okay, let's end all this. The danger of all this is this. In the story, the Philistines were always the enemy of God. If you read in the Old Testament, the Philistine army was always slaughtering the Israelites. How is it that you can become so dull where now the enemy, the ones who used to slaughter you, are the ones that you're paying to do what you should be doing? Or to think that the church is responsible for your spiritual growth. No. The only responsibility I have for your spiritual growth is to bring you to the water, but I can't drink for you. Every Sunday, I bring you to the river. Now you have to drink. To end the story, the Philistine army, they always paid, 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 paid. And then one day, everybody say one day. They went to war. And who did they go to? So they all got slaughtered. Leave a legacy for your family that's going to bring endurance. Leave a legacy in your family of ability. Come on, of calling, of divine purpose. Your name should mean something to you. Regardless whether you're accidental or intentional, you're leaving something behind whether you like it or not. You might as well go ahead and leave something good for your kids. Leave something good for people behind. Oh, well, I don't have kids, so he's not talking to me. Oh, no, I'm talking to you too. Because you have a responsibility to the people that, that you do life with at work. You should be an example, especially if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, I ain't talking to you. You, you get a, 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 a you know, free pass today. You're good. Not, not all good, but you're good with this part. You'll be better when I'm done. What I'm saying is there's a responsibility that we must take as followers of Jesus Christ and stop thinking that the other Christians will do the work. And then you have lost your way. Amen? If today's message impacted you in any way, and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below, and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.